he he motors upstream and gets to where the the pontoons are like in the riffle. They're in the bottom of the riffle, and he and he stands on the throttle, and he roars down, and he just gets airborne, and the trees are just coming up, and I mean he's clearly not going to clear the trees. That was John Gearock sharing a story about a crazy takeoff on an Alaskan bush plane. Sit down and strap on your seatbelt for this one. This is episode number 27 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview John Gearock, the man who has written some of the greatest fly fishing books of all time. He talks about some of the struggles he has had with his writing, his upcoming new book, Fishing Mountain Streams, and uh, Flying in Bush Plains. John clears the air on Tenkara, talks about the 1960s, and being stalked by a cougar. Don't miss this as John talks about his past uh, drug and alcohol use and why he hasn't had either in about 30 years. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to quickly thank our sponsors. Ascent Fly Fishing has customized fly box selections that they put together for your unique stream. These aren't just flies in the box, but they analyze the insect community, do a summary, and provide you with the exact patterns that are in your stream when you're ready to fish. Just go to AscentFlyFishing.com and use the coupon code WETFLYSWING to grab 10% off your next order. We are also brought to you by the original tie right, which holds flies and hooks securely so you can tie your fly on with little effort. The uh, tie right senior holds hook sizes 2 through 14 and the junior holds hook sizes 14 through 24. Tie right can help you tie clinch uh, clinch knots and modified clinch knots and many other knots to suit your needs. Head over to tyright.com and get started today. That's ty-rite.com. So, without further ado, here's John Gearock. How's it going, John? I'm uh, doing good. Good. Great to have you on here. I've uh, I've had a lot of I've I've been kind of reaching out a little bit uh, in the social media area, letting people know that you're coming on, and and I so I have a few questions just from some folks in the crowd. Um, but uh, before we get into it, I was hoping, you know, you've got a lot of background here, obviously, uh, kind of a prolific uh, fly fishing writer, one of the biggest names around. Maybe you could talk about how you got into fly fishing to start off and then how how that came to be, how you came to be to where you, now you've written, I think, almost 20 books? Yeah, yeah, 20. Um, well, I I grew up fishing. I mean, I don't remember... When I started fishing, I just vaguely remember being plopped on the end of a dock or on a on an overturned bucket or uh, or sitting in a rowboat, being told to be quiet so I wouldn't scare the fish, which of course is a myth. But um, and when I moved out west, I, I went to college in uh, in Ohio, and I graduated and. Um, you know, I had a I had a degree in philosophy, which a, a you know a bachelor's degree in philosophy is qualifies you to dig ditches, basically. So <laughs> I just came out west because I always wanted to come out west, and um, saw people fly fishing, and I I'd probably seen maybe one or two fly fishermen in my life, and. Um, but out here, that's that's kind of how people were fishing, and I just thought it was beautiful. You know, after chunking level wine reels and and hula poppers and stuff, hmm. I just thought it was gorgeous, and decided I wanted to do it, and uh, that was that. It wasn't easy yeah. then because you didn't have. There were a couple of books that were mildly helpful, and but there was no. Um, there were no websites, there were no, um, videos, shops didn't, shops didn't give lessons. I mean, you oh. know, it was just, and what year was this? Just, uh, this was in the, uh, this would have been, see, graduated in 68. So I think I arrived in Colorado in 1969. Okay. So right in the middle of the, uh, 
uh, kind of uh, free love and uh, the hippie movement. How were you? Uh, did you find yourself in the in the middle of that whole thing? Or was uh, that, yeah, was that strong out there. Oh yeah, yeah. This was like, um, yeah, this was like the 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 uh, hate Ashbury of the Rocky Mountains. Oh, nice. So, what was that? I mean, it's funny, you know, for me being on the outside of that, I'm a little younger, so I missed it. But I think I probably would have been involved in that in some form or fashion. What, maybe you can explain for those that maybe never felt it. What, what was that like? How, how was it different than it is now or that whole thing? Well, um, God, you know, books have been written about this. and mm-hmm. um, it's, it's hard to explain, but... Um, you know, it, it was tied up in, yeah, it was tied up with drugs. It was tied up with Eastern philosophy. Uh, we were the, were and are the post-war baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. And, um, a lot of us had grown up not, uh, you know, not exactly affluent, but not like wondering where our next meal was going to come from or, you know, if dad was going to come home after work and that, that kind of stuff. So it was like, hmm. you know, we had, we, we were coming from a little bit of comfort. And of course, uh, it was the Cold War and, uh, we were at war in Vietnam. It was the Cold War. So we thought we could be uh, wiped out by nuclear bombs any second. Hmm. And, um, so people just kind of let their hair down, hmm. literally, literally yeah. and figuratively. I mean, you know, we just, we, we freaked out and we started looking for different ways to do things. Um, uh, I think one of the, one of the things that got me into fishing as seriously as I got into it was that, you know, my dad loved to fish when he had the time, but he never had the time. Hmm. And it was like, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to like work my life away and not do what I want to do. Yeah. And he, he just had a, just, he was a working man and just pretty much worked all the time. Is that, that was the deal? Yeah. 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 No, no, not much time for vacations and holidays and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we'd go out every once in a while and go fishing and I loved it and so did he, but you know, he just never really got to do it. That's cool. That's cool. So you, uh, you know, so you became a trout bum. I mean basically because uh, you, you kind of looked at your dad. That was a, a big part of it. It was a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. So why, why, um, so philosophy, you got into, what, what was your, what was your plan there before you kind of got into all the fly fishing stuff? Or were you thinking about, uh, well, I guess you weren't thinking about fly fishing back then. Not so much. Um, I just, you know, that was back in the days when, People would get a liberal education, li- liberal with a small L, um, because it was seen as as beneficial to be educated. Hmm. So you dabble a little bit in the sciences, and you dabble in philosophy, and you take some sociology and some psychology and art history and literature, and you know you would just learn about civilization and you would come out the other end educated mm-hmm. and it, it, the there were certainly people who would go in and they'd study business and they'd come out and start a company and you know there was all that entrepreneurial stuff going on but there was still that that sense that it was just valuable to be educated yeah and to have to have read some books and to have looked at some art and read some of the great thinkers of the world and, um, you know, so, so that I didn't have a, in short, I didn't have a plan. Yep. Yep. No. And I think that's, uh, I didn't either when I went and got into, was going into college and I didn't really have a plan either. I think that's probably, I don't know, maybe that's, that's an okay thing to have. Um, and you found, you obviously found your path and you know, you're, you're on that, uh, I guess I kind of feel like I'm on that journey. Is that kind of what you feel like? You're still on that journey or are you kind of, you hit your, your destination. You kind of, now that you've got so much work published. I suppose it's a little of both. I mean, it's, um, being a freelance writer is just always a struggle. 
and but you do you do sort of get used to it after a while. You get used to making money in unpredictable increments at unpredictable times, and you get to be a good saver. Um, um, I'm still fascinated by the work. People always ask me, "Well, would you rather fish or write?" And um, hmm. I always, it, it, it always disappoints them when I say I'd rather write. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, I think I I think I enjoy both equally. Yeah. What um, you know? I was just thinking about now as you you came through and you got into started writing and. And I know you wrote a lot for magazines and, and lots of different places. What what was it? What did it feel like for you when you got that first book published? Um, what well, was anticlimactic? You um, you know, when you set out to be a writer, that's your, you know, your first goal is just to get anything published, and then you get something published, and you get a little check, which you know doesn't go as far as you thought it would, and. Then you start thinking, well, I need a book. I need to publish a book. And it's sort of the same thing with the book. It comes out. Um, the world doesn't stop. You know, you just you make a few bucks here and there and um, sell a few copies. And it's fun. You know, it's fun to see your name on the cover of a book. And mm-hmm. then it's like, well, uh, what's your next book going to be? And, you know, well, okay, yeah. Uh, So it's, you know, it's just kind of a continuum. It's still, but uh, that said, I'll say it's still really fun to have a book come out. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, you know, you, you, the the publisher sends advanced copies and you, you open that big fat envelope and you take out a couple of books and you go, God damn it, that's my book. Look at that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, you know, they're lately, uh, I haven't been delighted with all the the way the books have looked always. Um, they're okay. Mm-hmm. But lately, I've been having um, my uh, longtime friend, uh, Bob White, the, the painter, do the covers. So it's um, I, I think they're really handsome now. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they still don't. They still don't cause a big stir or anything, but uh, they're out there. People buy them. Mm-hmm. Uh, do a little book tour and go around, do readings at book st- bookstores and stuff like that, and it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh, I was just thinking as you were talking about, you know, how you you kind of like like doing the work sort of thing, and I had John Shuey on in a past episode, and um, and he was kind of saying the same thing that. You can't, you know, you can't wait. You got your book, you got the one book that's getting published, but, uh, you know, if you wait around and kind of pat yourself on the back, then somebody else is already kind of, uh, you know, ahead of the game on you. Is that kind of how you feel? Or are you just, you know, doing your own thing and you just keep publishing? And, you know, how, how is that process? And, and then another question for you on that is, I don't know if you ever heard the term, you know, kind of battling resistance, uh, kind of the um, Stephen Pressfield sort of thing, but. You know, how have you battled resistance? Um, I don't know. I haven't encountered a whole lot of resistance. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I started out, there were no, there was, there's basically no internet, right? Yeah. It was all, everything was in print. Everything was done over the phone or through the mail. Most people worked on typewriters. I mean, it was what, people would now consider pretty da- pretty damn primitive stuff. And, um, but there were a lot of magazines. And, uh, you know, they had to fill the pages every month. And so there was a market. And if you could write adequately, even just adequately, um, you could get work. And it wasn't great paying work, but if your ambition was to be a writer, you were writing, you were selling articles, you were getting paid, you making some kind of a living. And, um, and there was a pretty good book market still is in spite of, in spite of 
ebooks and all you know and websites and all that stuff there's still a pretty good book market yeah um, and so I don't know there's uh of course there was a level of resistance in the beginning but it was justified because uh, you know I tell I tell uh, beginning writers if you're getting rejected it's probably not because you're a misunderstood genius <laughs> It's it's probably because the work isn't very good. Yep. So it's it's like on you. Yep. Uh, and it's it's no one's it's no editor's responsibility. Your editor isn't your English teacher in high school. It isn't like their responsibility to tell you why it isn't good. They just say we don't want this. Yep. So you know you have to bear it down. Yeah. Um, Tom McGuane said. Once that, as the, as a writer, your only currency is your readership, and uh, the only way you can get a readership is to do quality work. So it's like all on you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean that's a <clears throat> a good point, really, for anybody. And I think about the stuff I'm doing with this podcast. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, there's nothing you know. I could produce a really crappy show, and, and people wouldn't listen. Or I could do my best to get great guests on and, and try to do my best to ask interesting questions and, you know, fly fishing tips and then people will listen and they'll pass it on. And I think, you know, that's that's what you've done with your books. Well, and yeah, and, and a thing like you do, um, your interview, your people are, are, um, uh, are your currency. And so... Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I've done a bazillion interviews, and every once in a while you get somebody that just doesn't really have anything to say. Hmm. Or, or you know, they're just having a bad day. They don't really feel like talking to a reporter. Hmm. And um, that's where, you know, the Terry Grosses of the world really shine, because a great interviewer can draw that out. Mm-hmm somehow and I was never a great interviewer I mean I was great if somebody had something to say but uh, hmm. if they were a little reticent I didn't really know how to draw them out yeah yeah I think that's uh, I kind of uh, you know not to not to pat myself on the back too much but I did have an episode with uh, I think it was episode let's see 27 um, yeah the line speed Jedi uh, <laughs> Or actually, yeah, uh, and uh, we were talking, and it was with Tim Rollins, and he said when we got on the phone, he was kind of nervous. He was kind of nervous to do the show, and and he told me this after, and I was just chatting. He said when we got on, he heard my voice for like 30 seconds. He just totally settled down, and that was just a great compliment, you know, that I've never had before, the fact that, you know, him hearing me just kind of chat and and it was yeah. a great interview. I mean, it was an amazing. He talked about how he learned to fly in Alaska. It was unbelievable. It blew me away. Um, but yeah, is that kind of? Um, I guess that stuff kind of resonates. Same th- with you. People pick up your book. I mean, you're a you're a, a kind of a epic writer now. I mean, that's probably how people feel when they grab your stuff. Yeah, you hear that. Um, to to me, it's just uh, it's just the work, and I struggle with it and try to make it as good as I can make it. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people, people sometimes think it's easy and, um, and it, sh- it should be easy. I, I was at a signing once with a couple other authors, including my old friend, Ed Engel. And, uh, some guy came up and said, boy, what a life you have. All you do is fish. And I was just in one of those moods. And I said, well, who the hell do you think writes the books? <laughs> and it, I don't remember what the guy did or said, but when he left, Ed leaned over and he said, you know, if people don't think the books are work, that's a compliment, dude. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, and, and it's like, you know, that's why I keep Ed around, because he just, he's one of those guys that everybody should have in their life that just straighten you out every once in a while. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, yeah, I think everybody has to have that, that time where things, yeah, you're, you're uh, kind of d- diverging in a different path. But uh, yeah, maybe we can jump into a little bit on your writing, because I mean, 
you've got a bunch. I mentioned one book, you know, The Trout Bomb. I think that was maybe your first book um, or at least early on. Well, it, for somebody who's never, uh, I mean, most of the people probably listen have, have read some of your stuff, but for somebody who's never read your stuff, well, how could you explain your, your writing or your, your books? Well, um, you know, I basically just tell stories. I'm an essayist, and so I'll pick uh, a subject or a place, and I'll just start somewhere. The lead is always the hard part. You know, the, the your lead is like the door that lets you into the story, and where that door is is real important. So I'll spend a long time. I just got back from Labrador a little while ago and and I'm still, you know, go through my notes and I go, well, where do you start? It's always tempting to start at the beginning, but mm. if you're not careful, you end up with, you know, the narration to your boring neighbor's slideshow about his <laughs> vacation to Hawaii, right? Yeah. Um, so sometimes you start at the beginning, sometimes you start in the middle, sometimes you start when you're packing for the trip. I mean, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. but you find, you find a place that's going to let you in and then hopefully that leads you through, uh, the rest of your material and then you you have to be open to other things that come in. I mean, one of the great things about having done this for over 40 years is that you have a tremendous amount of experience to, to draw from. Um, and things pop up, stories that maybe had always seemed unrelated but somehow relate to trolling for lake trout out in the boat in the rain and they'll just pop out of nowhere. And I think you have to be open to that kind of accidental discovery. Mm -hmm. And you're just, you're just looking to light up the story for people. Um, you know, writers are always talking about showing the reader instead of telling them. Um, you know who Roger Angel is? He's an old New Yorker no. writer. No. He's written for the New Yorker for... God, 50 years. He's an old guy now. In fact, I'm not even sure he's still alive, but uh, he once wrote a great essay called This Old Man, and he was in his 90s when he wrote it. And instead of saying that he had crippling arthritis in his hands, he said that if he made a pistol out of his finger and forefinger and thumb, pointed it at your nose and pulled the trigger, he'd shoot you in the knee. <laughs> and that's showing instead of telling, because it gives you a, a really vivid mental picture of what this guy's hands must look like. <laughs> Whereas if he just said, well, I have crippling arthritis in my hands, I mean, that's information, but it isn't a picture. No. Right? And then to do it that way, He's also telling you that he sees the humor in it. Yep. Right? He's not feeling sorry for himself. Or if he is, he's hiding it well. <laughs> so that's that's the kind of thing you you try to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, I I uh, and that's exactly what you do is you know, I know people that are have read your stuff, they're thinking that right now. I, I think I'm thinking back to some, a few stories you've written. The, you know, you do that throughout your whole thing. I mean, humor is part of your thing, um, and it's sometimes subtle and sometimes, you know, not so subtle. But I mean, you mentioned the lead at, at the start, kind of leading into the book, and that's what you mean there is just kind of the start, the first, when people pick up that book, that first kind of page or chapter they read. Is that what you mean by the lead? Well, the lead, yeah, that's there's the lead to the book, and then there's a lead to each essay. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, so when yeah. you go into the lead for, um, I mean, can you give us an example of, of a lead, uh, something that comes to mind, one of your books or one of your essays, or just to give an example, maybe of that struggle, how you, or, you know, how you got to that point where you had a great lead? 
And I have a story here. Uh, I have a story to, you know, if you can't think of one on top of your head, I have a one from Trout Bum I was going to ask you about, too. Yeah, I, you know, I really can't. I yeah. mean, I can't, I can't come up with an example offhand. Well, I got a good one then. Well, then, actually, this is the opposite of lead because this is the, um, this is towards the end. What would you call it when you, I guess, the outro or when you're at getting that end of the, the essay? I would call it the end. All right. <laughs> so the end. So this was, uh, I think it was, it was early on page 18. So it must've been, um, uh, I think this was in Trout Bum. And you talk about how, um, you were talking about basically you had a leak in your roof, you know, the house was falling down, but you were out fishing and that's what you're doing. And, and, and the wife or the girlfriend was kind of on, on your case and, um, and you basically said, you know, all things came together at the end because you had this fish tank, um, that was in the house and you ended up just moving it under, under the leak. And that ended up, <laughs> ended up catching the leak and like everything was good. You know, it was totally humorous because you were talking about, you mm. know, this leaky roof that needed to be fixed, but you couldn't fix it because you're fishing, but you solved it because you just moved the fish tank at the same time. You've got this. Uh, I guess a wife or a girlfriend who, I don't know if she's pissed off and you know, that sort of thing, but you know, can you talk about that a little bit? And I'm not sure if all your stories are, are straight from, from your life or if you kind of bring stuff out from other people or maybe you can talk just a little bit on that just generally. Well, everything, they're all autobiographical. Um, although I, you know, I'm, I, I tell stories about other people, but I don't make anything up. Um, I'm not a fiction writer. I don't make things mm -hmm. up. As tempting as it is sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all from your own life. But I mean, you know, your memories, um, you know, one of the reasons I take copious notes is just so I remember clearly. Most of my most of my notes from from trips are just where I was, people's names, what happened. You know, it isn't it isn't all uh, it isn't all um, uh, you know literature. It's just it's just nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. Where are the people's names? How do you how do you spell a Gulawak River? You know, hmm. uh, things like that. And by the way, what language is a Gulawak? Well, it turns out to be Athabascan, but it's a lot easier to get that stuff on site hmm. than it is to try and figure it out later when you get home. Yeah. So how do you do that when you, um, and I've talked about this on the show too, past, um, you know, I had uh, April Vokey on in a past episode and we were, and I know you've done some steelhead fishing and she was, we were talking about steelhead fishing. When you're sitting out there in the steelhead run, like, what are you thinking about? You know, hours and hours sometimes without hooking a fish. Do you, I mean, how do you take notes and then, and then, you know, how does that whole process work when you're out there fishing? Well, I don't usually take notes when I'm fishing. Yeah. Uh, although I do always have a notebook with me. Um, I might take, you know, if I take a break, um, you know, take a lunch break or whatever, um, uh, I might scribble something down, but generally I do it, I do it in the evening. Um, you know, when the fishing's over and the memories are still fresh, I'll just sit down and go, okay, what happened today? And, um, and I don't, I don't think about the writing. I just, I just think about getting the information down. Mm. Um, and I'll, you know, if somebody says something, great i'll try to write it down as quickly as i can so i just so i get the quote right things like that and i'll sometimes i'll sit down with somebody at some point during the day and and just ask some questions uh maybe not a maybe not a full interview but just ask questions that come up and, mm. and you know probably 80 percent of that gets dumped you know it's just deep background and it doesn't make it into the story, but you don't know what's going to make it into the story when you're taking notes. So you write down everything, right? Everything, everything you can think of. Hmm. 
And then, and then sometimes you go home and, you know, you're catching Dolly Vardens and you go, okay, well, what exactly is a Dolly Varden? So you pour through the books and, and figure out what's, what's the difference between a Dolly Varden and an Arctic char and, you know, yeah. Um, and then you, you know, you, I fished with a guy once in, uh, the Northwest Territories. Dr. Black, he was um, he was a doctoral uh, candidate at the time in fisheries biology with um, a uh, specialty in char. And you know, in taxonomy, there's lumpers and splitters. There's there's the people who want there to be lots and lots of species, and there's the people who want there to be only a couple of species. And this guy was a a lumper, and he said. As far as he was concerned, brook trout, Arctic char, Dolly Vardens, and lake trout were all the same species. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, that popped up somewhere. I know I've used that, but I didn't use it in that story. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's the kind of stuff you remember. And, uh, and it's just, it's just interesting stuff that pops up. Hmm. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. Do you, do you find yourself getting into some of that, you know, kind of the nomenclature and, or whatever there? Do you, do you find yourself, you feel like you're as much of a teacher as you are a storyteller? Um, not really. I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to teach anybody anything. I'm just trying to tell a good, accurate story that's, um, that's entertaining and maybe mines a little meaning out of, out of what's happening. But, you know, as a, as a journalist, you're, I mean, you have to be, if you make a statement of fact, you better by God be right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know that the way the news is now, but the fact is, I mean, if you say something about a kind of fish or if you say something about, the state of Maine or whatever, or some, some boat builder, some traditional boat, um, you need to be right. And that can, that can translate into a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I did work for newspapers for quite a while and you, you know, you learn that stuff. It's just, if somebody says, well, this canoe was, this kind of canoe was designed by so and so back in the 1800s, and um, and it's the way it is because he wanted it this way and that way. Um, you got to verify that, mm-hmm. or at the very least, you have to attribute it. So you say, "Well, okay, Frenchy the guide says this is why this boat is like it is." But if you're going to take that as gospel, then you have to. If you're going to, if you're going to put it out there as a statement of fact instead of a quote, then you have to verify it. Mm-hmm. So, and that's actually one we were before the show. We were talking about the limitations of technology, but that's one place where the internet can be useful because you can look that stuff up on the internet. But you can't trust the internet. But at least you can find sources on the internet and then go to the library and find the book Mm -hmm. and, uh, and look it up in the book. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That was, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, we were talking earlier off, off air just, yeah, I kind of brought up the thought about the, uh, how we're all becoming cyborgs. I heard, you know, (laughs) heard somebody talking about that Mm -hmm. because because of our cell phones and, yeah, I think that's, you know, we could probably talk another, uh, another hour about that. But, um, yeah, I was going to, I want to check, you mentioned, you know, I mean, obviously you, you've talked, uh, you know, Ed Engel and, and you know, he's in, uh, some of your books. I mean, and you've talked about a few other people. Do you have a few, you know, mentors or a person that really influenced helping you to get where you are today? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. Um, AK best. I started fishing with AK Best a long, long time ago. And, you know, he's an old school Midwestern dry fly specialist and uh, fly tire. And he taught me an awful lot. He probably taught me 
everything that I know about fly fishing that's worth knowing. And I've since gone on into other stuff that that he doesn't do, you know, spay casting and steelhead and stuff like that. But um, yeah, he sort of he sort of set me on my feet as a as a fly fisherman. Uh, I mentioned Ed just has a way of straightening me out when I like start to get you know off the beam a little bit for you know generally matters of attitude and stuff It'll just say look you <laughs> know, lighten up don't worry about it yeah um john mcphee who i've never met but uh i've read john mcphee for years and years i think i've read just about everything he's written with the exception of his books on geology which just lost me i just couldn't follow him <laughs> Um, he's got a great book called Draft Number Four about writing that uh, anybody who who aspires to write should uh, should read that. Mm-hmm. And there's a long, long section about his computer program that he uses, and that you can skip that. I did, but the but the parts where he talks about actual writing are uh, really brilliant. Really well written, of course, and really useful. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, those are. I've definitely uh, for AK. Is there a um, a book or something that you would recommend for somebody that wanted to check him out? Uh, he's written a couple of books. Um, his his. I think his sort of landmark book was called AK's Flybox. It was the the book where he laid out all his patterns that he's come up with. Oh, cool. Uh, I think it's still in print. Oh, good. Yeah. He wrote, uh, he wrote production tying, production fly tying. Um, he actually wrote a little monograph on, um, it was published by Lions Press, uh, called Dying and Bleaching Natural Fly Tying Materials, which is if you're a fly tire and you want to get into doing your own dyeing and bleaching and stuff, it's invaluable. <laughs> Uh, and he's got all his formulas for blending, dubbing, and all that stuff in there. Uh, he's got a couple other titles. Mm-hmm. Um, can't think of right now. Yeah, yeah, no. I think uh, they're all. I think they're all still available. Are they good? Good. All. Uh, and you mentioned a couple other links. All at, at the show notes at uh, wetflyswing dot com slash forty seven. I'll have all the notes that uh, we talked about here and links. People can check some stuff out, including including some of the books you have going. And I was just thinking, your most recent what is your most the most recent book you have out now? Uh, a fly rod of your own. Okay, yeah, fly rod of your own, great. And um, and that book, uh, maybe you can talk about is that book. I know it's uh, similar to some of your other books. How would you describe uh, you know that book and? Or, or is it different, or do you feel like it's kind of similar to some of the stuff you've written in the past? I feel like all those books, with a, you know, there's a couple of exceptions. I've written monographs on uh, bamboo fly rods and fly patterns and stuff like that. But all those books of the essays, um, I see them as just a continuum. Like, I see them as parts of one long book, um, part travel writing, part sports writing, part personal essay, mm-hmm. part autobiography. Um, and, you know, I consider them coherent books. The, what I'll do is I'll have 20-some essays uh, sitting there, and I'll go back and read through them and think, well, okay, what was I... What was I thinking about? What's been the theme of the last three years? And um, and then I'll put them in order and uh, and rewrite them into a coherent book. Mm-hmm. Um, but the um, I don't know. The impetus hasn't really changed. I doubt the theme has changed much. Although I couldn't really put my finger on a theme. Mm. Uh, never never could do that. Even in college when they kind of pounded into you. Um, I remember a kid in one of my English classes, the 
professor said, well, what was the theme of Moby Dick? And he said, man fights whale, whale wins. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's it's profitable yeah. to right. try to take a, you know, a whole book and say, well, it's about this. Yeah. Totally. No, it's definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you should keep up exactly what you're doing you got a you got a good thing there's no reason to to change you know the stuff and i've kind of uh you know read both your new and old stuff and yeah it's it's they're both similar and both great um so it's all good i was thinking of a story here's a story for you i can't remember what book this one was in but you were talking about and this is interesting because it's a steelhead uh kind of story and the first 30 episodes of my show are all steelhead i've kind of transitioned a little more into trout fishing now but uh, mm-hmm. but I have a lot of great steelhead guests, and we talked a lot a lot a lot of stuff. And one of them was Jim Teeny back in episode five, and he talked about how he um, how well I won't go into the story. You can listen to that episode. But he talked about how there's this um, New York Times or New York article that came out in one of the big papers, and basically said it basically said he throws rocks at fish. You know, man throws rocks at fish to catch steelhead. You know, and they kind of took yeah. it out of context. But basically, Jim explained that you know he didn't really throw rocks at fish. He threw rocks kind of uh, below fish or, you know, kind of to get him to go up into the place where he wanted him to go. And, you know, you could say what you want about that. But um, I, it kind of got, got me thinking when I heard you t- telling a story about a guy with spoons. And maybe it wasn't you, but this is a story where the guy with spoons would, would get, basically get the fish into the run where you could catch him with flies. Does that I, does, does that ring a bell? or do you I, re- I don't remember that. Okay. Um, but I do remember I was on uh, Miramichi one time with this guy named Frenchie, who I mentioned. Um, it was a whole whole story to himself. But, um, you know, we would um, we do drops. You're in, a, you're in a 23-foot canoe with an anchor, and you just come into these big, sprawling uh, runs, and you'd anchor at the top, and you'd start right at the boat like a rod's length of line and swing down as far as you could reach on one side, turn around, swing down as far as you could reach on the other side, pull the anchor, drop down, do it again, all the way down to the to the bottom of the run. And we'd caught, in this one place, we caught one salmon, and they were in there. They were, they were you'd see them, you could see them down there. And we caught one pretty nice salmon and the rest of them just wouldn't move. And so he, when we got to the bottom of the run, he just started the outboard and he did these fast figure eights all the way up through the, through the run <laughs> and anchored back at the top. And he said, you know, here, I have a cup of coffee. I'm going to sit here a minute. And I said, what the hell was that about? And he said, that's just to stir the fish up. <laughs> He said, he said, now, he said, now they're all looking around. They're going, what was that? And, and he said, in a minute, we'll start swinging down and they'll be more active. And, and sure enough, you know, like about the fourth cast, I hooked another salmon. Huh. So, I mean, and I, I, I understand that. I mean, people would, people would rock the pool, is called, if the fish were just sulking and, uh, just get them stirred up and then take a few minutes and, swing down through it again and a lot of times you catch fish uh-huh you know anadromous fish are, are just they're you know you're you're fishing you're trying to get a fish to eat that isn't eating right yeah. so you're like what do you do it's it's like it's like describing the sound of one hand clapping it doesn't really make any sense but it still works <laughs> and so people have all these all these odd things they do to to yeah get that fish to bite. Do you think and that's uh, one of the, yeah that's one of the things that fascinates me about it is is just you know trout fishing as hard as it can be sometimes it's still insert tab A into slot B. I mean it's like the fish is eating. Figure out what he's trying to eat and show it to him, and he'll eat it right theoretically. But with steelhead and salmon, Atlantic salmon, they're just, they're not eating. So you're trying to trigger some aggression response or some curiosity response, or you're trying to piss them off, or I don't know what it is you're trying to do, but um, 
I just I, I I'm fascinated by the mystery of that. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, with steel, and you do a little bit of uh, steel steelhead kind of uh, a lot of steelhead equal amounts of steelhead versus trout fishing, or well, I guess you're in Colorado, so a little more trout fishing. Yeah, I I I have steelhead fished some. Uh, I really like it. I really like spay rods. Um, I don't do it. I, I didn't get out this year. Um, I guess the returns weren't great. No. And um, but you know, any any chance I get, I'll go steelhead or Atlantic salmon or Pacific salmon. Pacific salmon are great. Mm-hmm. I'd love to get back up and, and uh, fish for either kings or silvers. I may have to do that again pretty soon. Oh, yeah, up to Alaska? Yeah. Yep. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. The original Tyrite is a long standing accessory loved by fly fishermen for decades. It's an accessory you won't live without once you uh, try it. No more drop flies or hook fingers. If you haven't seen this uh, tool yet, it's pretty simple. It looks like a like a pin, a little ballpoint pin with a retractable clip that allows you to hook, basically hook the bend of your uh, your fly in, so you don't have to worry about fumbling with a tiny little fly or hooking your finger. And you just kind of finish the knot like spinning spaghetti on a fork. Just quickly do your twists and you know stick the um, the tip it through and you're good to go. All parts are manufactured and assembled in the USA with a 100% lifetime guarantee. And I like to uh, uh, use the example of the uh, tiny little blue winged olive and, you know, in the wintertime. And that's always a good example because, you know, your feet or, fingers are cold and sometimes it's hard to hold those little guys. Uh, but the tie right makes this easy, you know, using a size 18 BWO, you'd be using the, the tie right junior and it just makes it a snap. So, uh, just wanted to give a heads up uh, for everyone. This is a great tool from a great company. I'm excited to have them on and want to uh, uh, get you guys to head over to tyrite.com and check it out today. That's ty-rite.com. We are also brought to you by Ascent Fly Fishing. Uh, do you struggle at times to tie the right fly on the end of your fly line? What if you had a biologist or entomologist with you next to you telling you exactly what was going on in the stream and what you need to put on? That's basically what Ascent Fly Fishing does with their custom fly box selections. And these guys aren't just a one-trick pony. They cover rivers all over the country, from Oregon over to Colorado, out to New York. Um, you know, they've got basically the entire country, and they're and they're building on from what they've got. And I've got a great example because... I have a box for one of my local streams, and it's super awesome and neatly organized. It even comes with a card that shows which rows each of the flies are. You know, breaks down dry flies on one side, uh, nymphs uh, on the other, and talks about different um, you know categories of basically the orders of flies, mayflies, caddis flies. It's just really organized, and a lot of flies are on there, which were ones that weren't in my box. So I'm excited to get uh, get on that. And, uh, but yeah, you can head over and uh, pick up a, a local selection from your stream. They have a 100% money back guarantee as well. If you're not satisfied for any reason. So, you know, I think it's time to cut the guesswork out of it. Head over to ascentflyfishing.com and use the coupon code wetflyswing to get 10% off your next order. That's, uh, ascentflyfishing.com, A-S-C-E-N-T flyfishing.com. Okay. Back to the show. Well, I've got a bunch of uh, different <laughs> questions or ways we could go. I was uh, I wanted to stick a little bit more to um, trout for a bit and just talk. I mean, especially since you're in Colorado, one of the meccas for you know trout fishing. Do you have you fished all over the place and talked about a lot of different rivers and streams? Do you kind of have a home stream or river you fish? And can you talk about you know how you catch fish there? Well, my home water is um, is a bunch of sort of small mountain creeks and um uh got they they're mostly feral um you know stocked but gone wild uh brown and brook trout um few few reintroduced cutthroats higher up but it's you know it's pocket water it's small water uh not terribly rich you don't get big blanket hatches of anything so it's you know it's pocket water 
small creek pocket water fishing. Not the most difficult hmm. fishing there is, but um, but I really like it. I really like just getting back in there, four wheeling back and hiking, and um, getting back in there. It was pretty. It was pretty uh, pretty thin this year. We we didn't have much water this year, so. Hmm. The last few times I've been out, there just really wasn't enough water, and it's a little too warm. Even even way up at the high altitudes, water's a tad warm for the for the fish. So it's uh, we've had a slow year here. Yeah, was but, it a, um, was it a bad fire season too? It has been, still is, still is. Fire season, you know, used to used to end in. October, November, and now it kind of goes all year. That's right. That's right. In fact, I've heard that uh, the Forest Service doesn't call it a fire season anymore. They they do call it like a fire year because it's yeah. just, it's that's the way it is. And I guess that's part. Well, and that gets us on to. I don't want to get a ton into the conservation piece um, here, but you know it does get it, bring us to that whole thing and, and changes there. And you talk a little bit about some of the conservation issues. What, what's your take on? or not your take, but you know, in your writing, you, you, you occasionally talk about that stuff. Do you feel like, um, you know, and again, I, I interviewed Steve Duda and we had this conversation as well. Um, but, uh, do you feel like you're, you kind of need to share those things? It's important to, to, well, you teach, you know, tell people about some of these issues. Yeah, I, I think it's real important. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, I think it's pretty much of a global issue at this point. Um, there was a time when, you know, you could worry about uh, you worry about minimum flows on your own little creek at home, but um, you know, we need to deal with global warming, and um, that's a political issue, and it's a global issue, and we need to get back into the Paris Agreement and. Uh, you know, we need to bear down on that because it's it's happening. It's clearly happening for anybody who cares to just, you know, look at the evidence. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not going to, we're not going to be able to turn it around in a couple of years. I mean, we're going to, we're going to live with it now for, you know, a hundred years. Yep. And, uh, you know, we've got to figure out how to deal with it. Yeah, that's, that's how I feel too. If it took, you know, it took us, uh, you know, a few hundred years to get here to this point where we're, you know, collapsing of populations and stuff, it's going to take us at least that long to get back to some kind of normal level. But, well, I guess there's lots of places where we won't get back to. Oh, yeah. Well, we won't get back, but we can, maybe we can not completely wipe out all life on the planet. That's right. That's right. That's, uh, well, when you're talking about the uh, small streams, fishing you know a couple of things popped in my mind and you know tenkara euro nymphing uh, a jeep uh i know you've had a jeep in the past you maybe you can talk a little bit about how you get into your your fishing areas whether you still have a jeep and then and then your process in tenkara i know you picked up tenkara a while back well um yeah that's that's not entirely true i i got interested in tenkara when it started to you know, first just started to get popular. And, um, I just decided that it was something I should write a, I was still writing my uh, column for fly run reel then. And I just decided there's a column here. And in the interest of, um, journalistic accuracy, I didn't want to just, you know, get a rod and spend an afternoon with it and write a story. Right. Yeah. So I, um, I decided to go ahead and, uh, and learn how to do it. So I spent a season, um, doing all my, all my small stream fishing with a Tinkara rod. And, uh, I went out with, um, Daniel Gallardo. I think he still lived in San Francisco then, but he came out and fished with uh, me and Ed Engel for a couple of days and we took them up on some of these little creeks we know and it's uh it, you know tin car is a nice it's a nice way to um to fish pocket water uh especially for smaller fish 
and um, and I wrote the story, and then it just got around that I was now a Tenkara guy. But I mean, I just I once I wrote the story, I think I only I think I only ever fished with a Tenkara rod once after that. Yeah, and that's because I was going out with Daniel. Gotcha. <laughs> and I just I just thought it would be polite. Yeah. To, oh, yeah. to fish with Tenkara. Gotcha. So yeah, that was uh, that was. What, no, I'm glad you you cleared the uh, cleared the uh, the information there. Yeah. So you're you're not into it, but you tried it, and it says a lot about you know your your style too. The fact that you'd pick up, do it for a whole season, and and you know test it out and and try it to, to be true on it. Well, and you know it's one of those things that that happens when you're writing. It's like you know I didn't make any money on that column. Right, because I, I spent so much time on it that uh, <laughs> you know the pay the payoff wasn't worth it. But but you know, it's any time you can do a better job instead of a worse job, you just have to do it. Yeah, and it, you just figure it, it's all going to work out in the end. Yep, and it did because that I, I then expanded that into a chapter in a book. I can't remember which one. And, uh, you know, so it probably worked out. Sure. Sure. Do you, um, so do you have a Jeep? I know you wrote about it in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Oh, cool. Cool. And I, I think what I, you, uh, and you use that and that's kind of one of your tools, right? That's one of your tools to get into some of these places. Is that the, the main reason that you kind of like having that thing? It's pretty much the only reason, yeah. um, Although, although you know, it is kind of fun to just tool around. I mean, sometimes if I'm just going to run down to town and and like pick up a quart of milk and go to the post office, I'll just hop in the jeep because you know they're way fun. Yeah, uh, I you know they're just a cool a cool unit, and uh, it's a uh, it's a two thousand, so it's the old style. It's not like the new big boxy thing, and um, Everything on it is manual. It's got crank windows and, you know, nice. manual transmission and all that stuff and manual transfer case. And, um, so, you know, I mean, it's just, it's totally analog. Yeah. And, and I like that. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I'm not a bad four wheeler. I don't, you know, I don't four wheel for sport like some people do. I four wheel to get where I want to go. Right. And, I'm I'm aware that the worse the road, the more likely it is to uh, eliminate the riffraff. So I, you know, I do some fairly adventurous stuff, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had I've had people in the jeep that have you know gotten that tight lipped <laughs> <laughs> yep. look to them, like holy crap! But. Um, you know, it's, it's, that isn't the part I, I enjoy. The part I enjoy is getting where I'm going and being able to fish. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't use it much this year because, like I said, those high country streams have been, they've been off. Just um, too low. Well, it was, they, they were too low. You know, when the, the runoff comes down, you usually get, oh, any, you know, usually from late July through maybe the first couple of weeks of September, depending on the weather, when that country just fishes beautifully and mm. it's, it's a lot of dry flies. And, uh, and it just, boy, the season was really short. I mean, it came down um, and it fished for a couple of weeks and then it was just too too far down. Yeah. And um, you just start, at some point, you just start worrying about the, the fish. You know, right. like, am I, am I going to, you know, hooking mortality, am I going to kill these fish? Right. Even though, even though I've released them and, and nobody wants to do that. Yeah. Cause the temperature of the water is probably a little bit higher as well. Well, just the temperature of the water and, and, um, you know, the dissolved oxygen is probably low because, uh, they're not running as hard. So the, the riffles aren't churning in as much oxygen into the water and, I don't know. You can tell. You, you, you know, you fish long enough. You can tell when a, a stream is not in the best shape, and the, the fish are beginning to get a little stressed, and mm-hmm. 
you just you just need to that's when you need to go someplace else where there's water yeah yeah or you know stay home and work right you uh and you touched on some adventure stuff and kind of tight-lipped in the vehicle do you have a a little short story of a time where kind of a you know you've talked about float planes as well like a near-death experience have you ever had one of those things out on your way to a fishing fish and water um it was one time in a float plane where i i thought i had a near-death experience but it was just because i didn't understand what the pilot was doing um we are in a little we we're on the george river in quebec with this great pilot named gilles moran a uh, french canadian guy uh really little guy i mean really short guy he has to he has to pile um uh, cushions on his uh, on the on the seat so he can see out the front of the plane. <laughs> and he's a wonderful pilot. And we were trying to take off in this very short stretch of river where we'd been camped, and um, it just wasn't it just wasn't a long enough. As far as I could see, it just wasn't a long enough stretch of river to uh, to take the plane off. But I mean, what are you going to do? You're, you know. You're, hundreds of miles from anywhere so he um he, he motors upstream and gets to where the the pontoons are like in the riffle <laughs> they're in the bottom of the riffle and he and he stands on the throttle and he roars down and he just gets airborne and the trees are just coming up and i mean he's clearly not going to clear the trees right <laughs> and because uh, there's a well, there's like a sharp turn in the river right there, and he's he's raging at these trees, and at the last minute he just tips the plane sideways and banks up around the river, along the river, oh, around wow. the corner, and takes off. And I mean, he didn't think anything of it. That's just how you do that. But I didn't understand it. I thought we were going right in the trees. Jeez. So I yeah. I sort of swallowed my gum on that one. <laughs> Damn, that is, I've never been in one of those float planes. I've, uh, I've been in some helicopters and stuff, but yeah, it just sounds like the stories you hear. It just sounds like you, you, kind of half the guys you're up there with are kind of loose cannons anyway. So you're kind of always on your seat because of that. I mean, you've done a lot of that float plane stuff. A fair amount. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I actually have not found that bush pilots are loose cannons. They, they, now I've run into a couple who like to act like loose cannons, to um, you know, to freak out the tourists because oh. that's that's kind of amusing. You gotcha. But I uh, I haven't. I, there's only one guy I can think of whose competence I wonder about. Um, and you flew with him? I won't. Yeah. What? Yeah, and I won't. I yeah. won't name him. But. No. Um, there was just that one guy, and then there's been a couple others who have the crazy bush pilot act. But once they're in the plane, it's kind of all business. Gotcha. Yeah, they don't want to die just like everybody else. They don't want to die any more than I do. No. And and they and they tend to know what they're doing. So, um, uh, Gilles, Gilles, one of those. I mean, he he does some stuff that just seems dangerous as hell, and. And maybe it is, but I mean, he knows the limitations of his skill, and he knows the he knows what the plane will do. Yeah, and it's, um, it, yeah, I mean, I just I just trust the guy. It's interesting. I've flown with him a lot. You say, yeah, you have somebody that that's good, and you can see that. I, I kind of compare my you know whitewater rafting. I've done a, a, quite a bit of that, and I kind of compare things to that because it feels like there's you know, you're pretty much in control, but you know, there's always a chance, you know, that's part of the mm -hmm. excitement. There's always a chance that, you know, you, you could dump and, and crazy stuff can go happen. But in, in, in the planes, I guess it, not quite the same thing, a little more controlled. I mean, it feels, it sounds like to you, you're, you're pretty now pretty confident. You're not, not too worried. You have a, a good pilot there. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's a hard comparison for me to make because I've been on the oars, but I've never flown a plane. Right. So, 
I don't know if there's a, I don't know if that's a valid comparison or not, that's but true. it sounds right. I mean, it, it kind of has a ring to it. Like, yeah, you know, you could get in trouble, but if you know what you're doing, chances are you won't. Um, nine times out of ten in a boat, uh, if something goes wrong, you just get wet. And yeah. if you, but if you like come out of the sky at high speed, you know, you, things can get pretty hairy. That's so, true. That's true. It, it, I think the stakes are a little higher in a plane. Yeah. Well, but, um, but you know, these guys, these guys are always looking for a place to set it down. I mean, you can just see them after a while. Once you know what they're doing, you can just see them doing it. <laughs> you know, you're flying along and they're just always looking, you look over here and look over there. And you finally realize, yeah, they're looking for a place to set it down if anything goes wrong. Is it a, uh, and that, is that like putting back in their memory banks or are they plugging into the GPS and stuff? Um, I, there, some, some are on GPS. Most, I think, now are on GPS. Yeah. Um, but uh, when I, the first times I flew, they weren't. They didn't have it. Um, at, at least not at that level. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it's all... It's all visual flight rules. You know, if you can't see, you can't fly. So if it gets too late or if it's cloudy, you know, that's that's sort of the biggest thing is somebody will fly in, drop you off, and say, well, you know, I'll be back at 4 o'clock to pick you up. And then a storm moves in. Right. Um, so I'm stuck out a few times, but... Hmm. Nice. You know, you just... But, you, but you, always, you always have stuff. I mean, you have a little... You have a little food and you have waterproof stuff. And so, you know, you, it's a little uncomfortable, but yeah, you can survive, you can build, build a fire and smudge it for, to keep the mosquitoes away. And, you know, yeah, nobody, nobody wants to do that, but it's, you know, it doesn't kill you. Yeah, you're. Uh, although, although I've been, I've been with people who thought it was going to kill them. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because you're, te- you're telling a story right now about, I think, a story in your recent book that you talked about where, the guys were dropped off. There was a group, and this was a total crazy thing. But basically, the the pilot, I think the pilot was trying to. He dropped him off. He was leaving to die, right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that was a, obviously the extreme crazy story. But those guys were out there for for weeks, kind of, you know, <laughs> thought they were dying. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, you're up there. I, I've been up to Alaska a few times as well, and it's. Yeah, you're out there, you know, you're kind of uh, on your own a little bit, especially when you kind of add the bears and stuff like that as well. So have you had any yeah. any other encounters? So other than planes, it has been pretty straightforward, just up there fishing, no, no problems? Uh, we had a bear chase us into a lake once and keep us out there for hours. Um, we landed on this. We were fishing out of uh, Ted Gerke's Lodge and. uh, Ilyaska, outside of Ilyaska, and we flew into a, a river and um, landed on the lake, and we were going to hike up the river, and um, after the plane left and was going to come back and, and pick us up, um, this this young boar, uh, brown bear, came down and just got real aggressive with us and backed us into the lake. Hmm. Uh, up to our armpits and then just sort of paced around Jeez. on the shore and sat. So he kept us out there all day. Wow. And we were, and we were pretty hypothermic by the time the, the plane showed up. Never did, never even strung up a rod. <laughs> and I had a couple of bears just get a little aggressive or, I don't know, it's hard to tell. They, a lot of times they're just, you know, they're after the salmon, you're after the salmon. And if the bear wants to walk through where you are, you let him. I mean, yeah. So, and it's, you know, you feel like he's being aggressive, but chances are he probably just, probably not. He's probably just looking for salmon. Yeah. Well, and it's just a, um, yeah, I, I've always said, you know, I've been out in the woods lots and, you know, lots and lots. And I know there's been animals around me, you know, cougar. Well, we just had actually the first documented uh, cougar death um, of, uh, cougar killed a, a human for the first time i think in oregon's history just yeah i read about that yeah just recently so but again it's such the extreme you know it's the one in the million one in a million sort of thing that most of the time you just basically give them their room and it's no problem don't surprise them 
Well, the problem with cougars, I mean, bears, bears just lumber around. They don't, you know, they're at the top of the food chain. They don't care who sees them or hears them. Um, cougars are, are, are kitties, you know, they're big kitties and they're real secretive. And half the time you don't even know they're there. No. Better than half the time. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I've lived in mountain lion country for almost half a century and I think I've seen four. Yep. But I, but I mean, I found just on my little piece of property up here in the foothills, I mean, I found deer kills, scratch marks on trees, poop, tracks, you name it. They're around, but you never see them. No. Nope. You nope. never see them. You never hear them. I mean, they're just, they're like ghosts. Yeah. But you know they're around. <laughs> yeah, I think. I, I was, think, yeah. I was hunting rabbits one time and you know, on snowshoes. And, uh, I was kind of halfway up a hill, a, a ridge going around tracking a, a snowshoe hare. And I happened to look over my shoulder and there's a mountain lion stand behind me and above on the ridge looking at me. And as soon as I looked at him, he turned around and ran. Hmm. And just out of curiosity, I slogged up there and I could see that his tracks he was above and behind me, and his tracks paralleled my tracks oh, for like wow. half a mile. Damn. And I don't know if he was stalking me or if he was just curious. Or I mean, just like, what is this, you know, slow-moving, bad-smelling thing in my woods? Um, yeah. You know, I, you don't know, but... Yeah. Yeah, things like that happen. I, You know, I think we, all of us who spend time outside we've probably been in more danger than we know a couple of times that's right that's right no it's it's interesting stuff i love the i've seen the same same as you i I, i've seen i think three cougars in in the in the wild and they've all been amazing amazing experiences for sure um you know the tourists are always worried about wild animals they think wild animals are going to get them right and and the chances are What's going to get them is they're going to get lost or they're going to fall. You know, their own their own ineptness is going to get them. That's right. Or they're going to get in an yeah. accident driving to the site. Yeah. Going yeah. Accident. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. Oh. I mean, we we lose them. We lose tourists every year. I live right a few miles from Rocky Mountain National Park. Oh wow. And uh, you know, God, search and rescues up there a couple of times a year looking for people. And every once in a while, they, they bring the body out in a, in a body bag because somebody walked off in the mountains by themselves, didn't tell anybody where they were going. They're dressed in shorts and flip-flops and a T-shirt, and they stay out overnight. It gets to be 28 degrees. Uh, they panic. They run. They fall. It, you know. Yeah. I so, was... I, you know. It does happen. Yeah. I was thinking, going back, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, death and stuff, you know, like that. I think uh, this is another quote I heard you mention it, and it was something like, you know, when you were 40, you were kind of thinking, like, it was the whole thing with alcohol and, and drugs and stuff like that. And I know I've had times in my life where I've definitely drank way too much beer and, you know, and I kind of wonder sometimes, like, what effect you know, that might have long term. But I think the quote you said was basically at 40, you wondered, you kind of thought about, well, if, if I take care of myself, you know, maybe I have another 40, you know, if I don't pickle my brain. Um, what do you feel, you know, when you look back, you know, obviously it's fun kind of doing that thing, but have you seen kind of the drugs and alcohol or any of that stuff uh, feel like that's affected your life? And it could be positively or negatively. Well, what's your take on that? Um, I think... Probably it affected me more positively than negatively because it's I, I, I hit a point late thirties, early forties where I just thought, okay, you need to stop this. But you know, I think I think drugs and alcohol tended to loosen me up and um, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that stuff. And then I just sort of decided, well, if you're going to be a writer, you should probably have your wits about you. And, you know, and you, you know, you see people who, who've gone 
too far and don't have their wits about them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you just, um, you know, you drift out of it. I I haven't had a drink. I haven't had a drink in 30 years. No kidding. I haven't smoked pot in at least that long. No kidding. Even though it's, uh, even though it's all legal, it's becoming legal now, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it should have been a dream come true. And, and actually, I mean, I was, I've always been in favor of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote a, I wrote an editorial in the local paper saying, telling people to, to vote for legalization because, you know, cool. it's a victim, it's a victimless crime. It doesn't hurt anything. No. Uh, it's, uh, alcohol is much more, uh, dangerous yeah. and, uh, well, causes, causes a lot more problems. I mean, people don't smoke pot and beat their wives. No. You know, no. they really don't. No. And not only does, does pot not hurt anybody, but it actually, it actually helps and can help millions of people just with the, um, and that's even the, the non T, you know, just the CBD stuff just for health stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, there's a whole industry out here where they've found that, uh, They've they've manufactured some or or uh, engineered some kind of uh, marijuana that they call uh, what do they call it? The hippie's disappointment because it has hardly any THC in it. Nice, <laughs> but it but it's keeping these kids from having seizures. Yeah, and a, a lot of people have moved here so their kids can get this treatment, and they're you know their kids were essentially dying. Because they were having seizures, and now they're they're not anymore. Wow! Um, just as one example. Yeah. yeah and you know, the people who were against it, they thought Colorado was going to turn into the night of the living dead overnight. But you know, it just hasn't. No. Nope. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't know. You don't you don't see zombies wandering the streets or anything. No, no, and they and they've done a good there's job. No at, more, yeah. There's there's no more people stoned. Now than there were before it was legal. No, no, and that's the same thing in uh, Oregon. And you see the same thing where, you know, I think they've done a good job keeping things like you know you go into those places to get you know get your get your stuff, and I mean they're clean and they're you know, I mean it, it's yeah. not it's not a, sh- a shady sort of thing. I mean, it's a great it's a great experience. So yeah, yeah, you're not buying pot from some barefoot guy down a dark alley anymore. And, and that's the great thing about it, you know, for for those who, uh, you know, who do it or want to do it. I mean, anybody could go in. Yeah, it's like you could choose your, you know, exactly. It's down to a, just a great, you know, like, how do you, what do you want? Do you want a little CBD? Do you want a lot of CBD? You know, it's just this amazing. So I think, I think it's been pretty cool to watch that whole uh, transformation. Yeah, I did actually buy some once because after it became legal, uh, just as a, um, uh, I was writing a column for the paper, for the newspaper, and I just wanted to see what it was like. I bought plenty of pot illegally in my time, yep. and I just wanted to see what it was like to buy it legally. Yeah. And it was kind of fun. Yeah. And, uh, and I gave it, I gave it to a friend who was happy to have it. But you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can get everything from, Bruce Banner and AK-47 to Mama Son and Sleepy Time. I mean, mm-hmm. whatever you want. That's the great thing. The two things I like most about it is uh, the names that they come up and then the names of the actual businesses as they're popping up around. I mean, they are, they're all pretty much hilarious. They're all just, just the great name. And you probably see that too, these names of these places that are popping up. Yeah, not so much the names of the places. Names of the places seem pretty innocuous. We've got a Bud Depot and you know, right. stuff like that, but but uh, the the names of the of the marijuana, like Bruce Banner. I mean, what does that tell you? Yeah, I don't know actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, death, trying to figure that out. Star. There's a Death Star, and he's like, okay, I I got I got a sense of what that's. That's true. That would be like. That's true. No, this is this is awesome. I we bet you I think this off air, but Joe Rogan, you know, the podcast, which is one of the biggest podcasts, you know, on, in the world. He he had a uh, uh, whatever the the CEO of uh, Tesla on mm-hmm. and, and actually smoked some weed on uh, on the podcast. So 
the fact that we're remote, uh, you know, if, if we were in person, I might break out something for you to try to do the same things if I could increase my ratings on the show. But uh, if <laughs> I, I guess if we were to be in that place, uh, you know, in person, you probably still wouldn't partake, huh? Probably not. But, you know, I'm drinking some really strong coffee here. Oh, there helps. you go. There you go. So that is that your is that kind of your your vice now that you have in your you coffee and tobacco. When I when I quit everything, drugs and booze, I promised myself there'd always be coffee and tobacco. Yep. And what is the tobacco like? What 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 form? Cigarettes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you still so that still helps with your uh, just. I mean, that is yeah. That's the, definitely a vice. Coffee and tobacco. Well, you know, they're legal. They don't change your behavior much. Yep. Yep. What um, I was thinking when you were talking about, um, again, <laughs> staying on the uh, the marijuana uh, sort of thing, um, I think about the Beatles, right? Because they went from this little clean cut, you know, Beatles band, right, with all their music. And all of a sudden the White Album came out, I think was that yeah. one. And, and it and it basically, I think a big part of it was because they started smoking weed and, and kind of doing mind altering uh, LSD and stuff. If we look back at your books in that time when you stopped um, kind of, you know, all the alcohol and all that stuff, do you, can we see a change in your writing, do you think? Well, I don't, I, I, it'd be hard to put a finger on a specific change, but I actually think I write better now than I used to, but I think it's probably as much... I think part of it is is uh, not being stoned, and part of it is just uh, that I've worked at it for forty some years, and you know you're bound to get better instead of worse. Yeah, yeah you've, um, got, you've you've kind of perfected your craft, right? Well, no, but I'm but I'm in the process of perfecting the craft. I don't think I'll ever perfect it, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, I'm I'm still working on it, and I still consider myself a a student of writing instead of a master. Right, right. Now that's awesome. Well, John, we're uh, we've definitely pushed it here. I I, I know. Um, I don't know if you have a, a quick a little time for a little rapid fire round. I think we're coming close to our uh, start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just have a few questions I always ask everybody, and uh, maybe I could zip through if just a rapid fire. So the first one is um, just a couple of flies. You know, you're talking about fishing those spring creeks do you have uh, maybe a couple of go-to flies you like to use there yeah i really like the um here's your parachute okay and um a lot of times i will fish a here's your parachute with a um, here's your soft tackle dropper behind it oh cool although my my rule is if i get two or three strikes in a row on the dry fly I cut the dropper off okay yep Perfect. And um, so as far as just books and resources, obviously you've got tons of stuff here. Do you have anybody else you would recommend to, uh, or you like reading as far as magazines, books, or other videos or resources? Oh, God. Uh, I would read John McPhee, mm -hmm. pretty much anything by John McPhee. Um, I really like Alice Monroe. I know she's not for everyone. But I really like the way she tells a story. And in fact, I've got every book she's ever published, and I study her trying to, trying to figure out exactly how she does what she does. And um, the jury's still out. Uh, it's, it's like magic the way she tells a story. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've always liked Tom McGuane. Um, I know him a little bit. We're not pals or anything, but I've fished with him a few times and correspond from time to time. He's a really interesting guy, really fine writer. Um, uh, I always liked Jim Harrison. Uh, broke my heart when he died. Mm. Uh, and Harrison, you know, I, I like McGuane for his just superhuman control. I mean, Every word is right. Everything is right. And I've liked Jim Harrison for his apparent lack of control. The guy's just totally out of control. <laughs> but, and you know, it's like this complete stream of consciousness 
free association stuff. But once again, I mean, he really can tell a story. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Lots of I've I've read a bazillion a bazillion writers and right. People asking people ask me about famous fa- favorite writers and it always just the names always fly out of my head. Uh, it, it actually doesn't hurt to go back and read old good old Ernest Hemingway. Sure. Um, he really, you know, if it wasn't for Hemingway, we wouldn't, none of us would write the way we do. Huh. He just he brought in that journalistic plain spokenness that, uh, All right. yep. before that, before Hemingway, everybody wrote like a Victorian lawyer. No kidding. And after him, after Hemingway, everybody wrote like a journalist. That's crazy. Just a, yeah, it is crazy. So Peter Matheson, he's another one who oh, died yeah. here not too long ago. Um, the Snow Leopard is a great book. Far Tortuga is a great book. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a, on Hemingway. That's a pretty interesting thing. When you look, thinking of your your life, uh, you know, I kind of ask this question question occasionally. If you look out fifty or hundred years when we're when we're both gone, is there anything kind of you would want to be remembered for, or, or you know, in all your work? Oh, it would just delight me if in 50 years people would still read my books. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. And they'd probably, they'd probably be reading them as a historical artifact, but huh. that doesn't matter. I mean, if people, if people are still reading me in 50 years, that would be delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like with the fly fishing writing, and, and that's one of the interesting things where you're You've got your craft. You're at t- you're at the top of your game. You're you're you know so well known. Um, but even just in fly fishing, I mean, we've talked about this before too. There's tons of fly fishing writers. Like maybe more r- people writing about fly fishing than other other sports and stuff put together. I don't know how much truth there is to that. But w- what's your take on that? Well, I don't know. I think there's something about um, there's something about the sport. You know, a lot of writers fly fish. Um, I think there's something about the sport and something about that kind of urge to, to write that intersects somewhere. Mm. Um, and I think it's, um, just in terms of, of the fly fishing, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, what a life it would be if I could make a living writing about what I like to do. Yeah. Um, and so you, you know, I just, I was just with, uh, Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis oh, yeah. up in, uh, Labrador. Interesting guy. In fact, I did his podcast a while back. I heard that. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a guy who just parlayed fishing into a life and, uh, you know, he hooked, he did it differently than I did. He hooked up with Orvis, but he's written some really really good instructional books. I mean, I still, when people say, what's, you know, what's the book to read if I want to get into fly fishing? I, I tell them it's Tom Rosenbauer's fly fishing guide or mm-hmm. his fly fishing guide, mm-hmm. because it's just all, he's a, he's a good technical writer. It's all good, usable, accurate stuff. And, um, uh, but you know, he was up there with, uh, guy named Colin somebody who was they were shooting a TV show up there hmm. and so he was he was real busy but you know he just had a ball he was just having a ball yeah and he was working and that's you know anytime you can you can be doing your job and having a ball that's just a real attractive idea to people that's cool I think I think the uh yeah I love the, I love the Orvis story because I think they're they're kind of known as the big corporate you know i guess they're the big company that's been around a long time but the cool thing is they got a lot of really great people in that company and i'm hearing those stories now that i've been doing this podcast and for you know whatever your take is on orvis and stuff over the years i think i think they got some really neat people in there and you know which is oh i mean i guess you could say that for a lot of the fly fishing companies well they yeah they attract people like that yeah um, so yeah, keeping the, a couple more here, uh, uh, John, uh, before I let you go, but, um, uh, do you have a bucket list, uh, place you you haven't fished that you kind of, you know, before the end of the day you want to get out to? Not 
really. I mean, I I ha- I would like to go up to um, Iceland. Oh yeah, and um, fish not not so much for salmon as um, sea run browns. Mm-hmm. I've never caught I've never caught sea run brown trout, and I I'd like to do that. Yep. Okay. And um, I was actually working on a guy who has a. Uh, runs a fishing outfit up there, but nothing, uh, nothing ever came of it. Hmm. But that's that's one place I wouldn't mind going. Okay. And um, you've done a lot of traveling. What is do you think is the thing you love most about the traveling that you do to get to your fly fishing spots? Oh God, just finally getting off the plane and being there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy the traveling part of it as much as I enjoy where I, where I get to. Uh, I was, like I said, I was just in Labrador and, um, God, that's awful to, to go to Labrador. I mean, it's a lot of flights and oh, really? a lot of airports and it's real expensive. And, um, yeah. I won't, I, I, get, I won't mention, mention the airline, but they're not the most dependable. Sure. And, um, you know, I'm actually more comfortable once I get up to Wabush and I'm staying in the, I stay in a hotel up there called the two seasons <laughs> instead of the four seasons. <laughs> and, um, and you know, it's just, it's all fishermen and basically fishermen and miners. It's a, it's a big iron mining area oh, yeah. up there and that's the jumping off place. And from there it's all float planes. And that's really comfortable flying for me because you know i mean if if somebody's uh if somebody's late they'll wait for you mm-hmm. you know <laughs> they go well uh, geez i think john's still in the bathroom they go okay we'll wait and um you know if the weather's bad you just don't fly yeah you know the pilots just say go back have another cup of coffee maybe it'll clear off in an hour that's and I, I don't know. I just find that I just find that really comfortable. Um, you know, it's more like flying in a De Havilland Beaver is just like riding in somebody's pickup truck, basically. Except it's up in the air. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. And uh, I just had one more quote, and this comes from I think this was Ed Engel. You wrote about, um, and he said something like, I guess, uh, kind of paraphrasing. He. Uh, you know, he said, I, I don't write about any stream I can roll cast across and I can roll cast a hell of a long ways. I love that quote because we've had this talk before about, you know, you're writing about fishing and what's your, what's your feeling on, you know, I know a lot of the places you write about, you don't kind of mention names and things like that, but mm-hmm. you know, as far as more people going to these places and more pressure, what, what's your feeling on that? Well, I, you know, basically I don't like it. Um, when I when I moved to Colorado, there were like two million people in the state, and now there's more than five million, and oh, wow. it's still going. And I think all those three million new people bought a fly rod the first week they were here. <laughs> so the rivers have gotten really crowded, and the fishing has declined uh, about the way you'd expect it to. And so I, you know, it's, um, every once in a while I think about moving somewhere. Um, you know, it's a little less settled. I mean, I live in a nice place. I'm, I'm off the, I'm off the state highway. I'm up in a dead end valley. Uh, it's quiet here. I've got a little bit of land around me and Mm -hmm. got more, got more mule deer than neighbors. And, Mm. but, um, it's it's starting to get crowded and i kind of wish it weren't but you know at the same time i'm going to turn 72 this fall and big moves get harder as you get older yeah you'll uh, you'll learn that in mm-hmm. time and um i can still there are still out of the way places i know and they're maybe not they're they're not quite as unknown as they once were, but they're not real popular, and I can I can get away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
still and and I'm not sure that at my age I'm not sure I'd learn a new place quite that completely if you know what I mean yep no I hear you I hear you we just moved recently and God, we're we're eight months into it and it's still <laughs> we're still struggling you know it's uh I think yeah it's it's moving is tough I well it's the hardest thing I guess one of the hardest things we, we all do when you have to do it yeah seems like it yeah. Okay. Good. Well, I think I'm about there. You know, I, I, I've got a zillion questions I could still ask you, John, but I hope to, uh, maybe if, uh, if this wasn't too, uh, too tough on you, maybe down the line next year or something like that, we could bring you back on to answer the rest of them. Um, but uh, I just want to leave, uh, just before we get out of here, the next six to 12 months, do you have anything new that, uh, we can expect from you or anything to keep a lookout for? Well, I'm working on a book now or actually will, uh, we'll start uh, towards the end of the month once I've got one more trip. And uh, it's due at the publisher in uh, spring of 2019. It'll be published in uh, 2020, spring of 2020. Don't have a title yet. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So you got some more books coming out, and I think you mentioned I heard somewhere where you've got another two- or three-year contract or something like that on your with your current publisher. Yeah, yeah, I signed another two book contract. Two books, okay, great. And um, and you know, I I the, after uh, Fly Rod and Reel went out of business, Bob White and I, Bob's my illustrator on my column. We moved to Trout Magazine, so we're in Trout Magazine now. Oh, nice, nice. All right. Well, I will. Um, I'll leave a link to those places. And as far as people to find you, you think uh, John dot com is probably the best place? If they have questions. Probably right is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'll uh, that that links to everything. Okay, great. Well, I'll do my best to uh, cover everything we we talked about here in the show notes. And um, yeah, John, I just want to thank you. We definitely went a little bit longer on time and had a little technical uh, stuff at the start. So I appreciate you coming on to uh, you know talk about all this. And just want to thank you for everything you've done. I think with fly fishing, I think the more people that read you, I think the more you know. I we talked about how it's maybe more pressure, but I think that the more people we get into fly fishing, the better more conservation minded people we're going to have as well. So I, I, I want to thank you for everything you've done. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 47 and uh, please head over to uh, iTunes and click the subscribe button. This is the best way that I know of to get the show out to new people and hopefully help some others uh, find their first fish. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to connect with you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.